WHGE 95.3 FM coming up the open eye my children of the sun. Welcome to the Open Eye on WHGE 95.3 FM, the advocacy education station. Yes, indeed. And if you tuned in here, you are going to get some education. I'm Patrice Gibbs, your third eye optometrist and host. All right, ready to get them started. And as we start, every generation has its purpose. Ours is to reveal the truth and, re and reverse the brainwashing. Let me get my disclaimer out the way. All right. Oh. Express on open eye are those of the hosts, guests, and contributors, and do not reflect the policy or position of WHDE 95.3 FM, nor our sponsor, the Delaware Center for Homeless Vets. Any content provided by organized hosts, guests, or contributors are theirs and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, company, or individual. WHGE 95.3 FM. Yes, indeed. We will never be free as a people until what educates us becomes more important than what entertains us. All right, um, thanks, Sister Tracy, for that. Yeah. Moving right along. You know, it's something I see it often. I see it all the time. Come on. Yeah, I see it all the time. You know, some of our, our religious brothers and sisters, some of our Christian people, denigrate those of us that revere our ancestors. It be something to think about. The ancestors connect us to the spirit realm and intercede in our behalf. They guide us through our journey. Because of our ancestors, many of us have been given a second and third chance to fulfill our destiny. Because of our ancestors, many of us survive. The, the development of the Iwa Pele, good character, will allow us to one day become ancestors who can intercede on behalf of those who come after us. Only elevated spirits carry the ashe, needed to elevate a nation and enlighten the world. Having Iwa Pele will elevate and enlighten our spirits. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank uh, Brother Jardea for when I'm getting ready to, for the following. Mm -hmm. Ancestors. Definition. Ancestors are the individuals from whom a person is descended. This includes family members from previous generations such as grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. Cultural significance. In many cultures, ancestors are revered and respected. 
often being seen as protectors or spiritual guides. Ancestor worship or veneration is a common practice in several cultures, particularly in African, Asian, and indigenous traditions. Now, the role in spirituality. Ancestors are often believed to influence the lives of the living, providing guidance, protection, and wisdom. Rituals to honor ancestors can include offerings, prayers, and ceremonies. Saints. Okay. Hey, hey, Sherry, I see you, sister. Saints are individuals recognized by certain religious traditions, particularly Christianity, mm -hmm. as having lived lives of exceptional holiness and virtue. They often believe to have performed miracles or to have interceded with the divine on the behalf of others. Religious significance of that. In Christianity, particularly within the Catholic Orthodox and some Angel uh, Angelican traditions, saints are venerated and are seen as intercessors between humans and God. They are often invoked in prayers and their feast days are celebrated. The role in spirituality, saints are viewed as models of faith and virtue. They are often asked for help, protection, or guidance in specific aspects of life. Many Christians believe that saints can intercede with God on their behalf. Now let's do a comparison here. Cultural versus religious. Ancestors are more tied to cultural and familial traditions, while saints are specific to religious traditions, particularly Christianity. The role in society. Ancestors hold a familial or tribal significance while saints are revered more universally within religious communities. Veneration practices. Veneration of ancestors often involves family-centered rituals while the veneration of saints typically involves liturgical practices within a religious context. The concept of ancestors versus saints might arise in discussions about how different cultures or religions honor the dead and speak spiritual guidance, highlighting and seek, excuse me, and seek spiritual guidance, highlighting the differences similar and similarities in practice. Mm -hmm. Now, in some religions, ancestors and saints are both considered to be holy companions who can act as intermediaries between God and humankind. Now, the interesting thing is, hey, hey, Steve, all right, is that Christians also, I mean, uh, Christians often demonize those of us that revere our ancestors. And there was a part in there I read where it mentioned ancestor worship. We don't worship ancestors, the ancestors. Okay, we hold them in high esteem and veneration. Now, Christians, like I said, they demonize us for the same thing, but turn right around and worship saints. And you know, it's, it's something, oh, you're, you're an atheist and you're this, that, and the other, and they have all kind of um, criticisms for you. And you're not doing it their way. Okay? And as um, Sister Sherry often lets us know, I'm not offended by people believing in a God. I'm offended by believers trying to force others to live by the rules of the God they believe in. And you know what? That's really the Christian American way. Yeah, and they often do it. All right, all right. Move right along here. Uh, let's see. All right. WHGE 95.3 FM.
Steve Gibbs, your third eye optometrist. Speaking of people that are revered, the Western culture revered the Greek philosophers and Greek civilization. Mm -hmm. They point to Greece as the creator of their civilizations. When I talked about um, last week about um, historian, uh, what's his first name? Mm -hmm. Dr. Smalls pointed out to us that the Greeks and the Romans don't actually have a civilization. They did not actually create a civilization. What they did was borrow and steal from others. I'm telling you something, all these Greek philosophers studied on the continent of Africa. Okay. And this is this is this is just a fact. Famous well known Greeks whom we when, whom we study their history and writings, they study at the feet of ancient Egyptians. Kemet scholars at the Temple of Waset. Founded in 1405 BC. And also in Timbuktu Temple, founded in 1201 BC, in what is now Maui. Phil Plato was a student, philosopher Plato was a student at Waset Temple for 11 years. Also, Aristotle was a student there for 11 to 13 years. Socrates spent at least 15 years at the same temple. Likewise, Euclid, Pythagoras spent 22 years there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go over that list. Plano. Studying Egypt for 13 years, considered to be the most ancient of all antiquities. Pythagoras studied philosophy, geometry, and medicine in Egypt for 22 years. Thales, the first Greek philosopher to, uh, to study in Egypt, seven years. Hippocrates, who Western scholars call the father of medicine, recognized the Egyptian multi-genius Imhotep as the father of medicine. What is, what, what is now called the Pythagorean theorem was used to build the pyramids in Egypt a thousand years before uh, Pythagorean was born. If you measure the circumference of the um, Great Pyramid, you get the figure of pi. Mm -hmm. Western academia didn't know about that for thousands of years later. Plato said, <coughs> Egyptian education makes students more alert and humane. Plato told his students to go to Egypt if they wanted to study the minds of the true great philosophers. Herodotus the Greek historian described ancient Egypt as the cradle of civilization. He also mentioned they were black skinned and had woolly hair. Yeah, it's an interesting thing with um, Russian academia and their relationship to Herodotus. Whenever Herodotus, or they find where Herodotus talks about the African origin, the black origin of ancient Egypt. Yeah, well, you know, he he, he often uh, indulged in mythology. And, yeah. But they consider him the father of history. Only when it suits their purpose, obviously. According to Aristotle, the mathematical arts 
had never before been formed, constituted, or elaborated anywhere else, originating in Egypt only. The facts show Africans opened the doors of their nations, empires, and kingdoms to foreign people. These guests were welcomed with respect and honor according to African traditions. After grasping hold of the ancient science, information, and resources, many of the foreigners used African kindness to exploit, enslave, plunder, destroy, and cause division amongst the Africans. To this very day, every thriving nation relies on the exploitation of African resources and ancient culture and knowledge. And that's the truth restored. WHGE 95.3 FM, the open eye. Open eye, Trees Gibbs, third high optometry. You know, one of the things I talked about last week was Eisenhower and the fact that the uh, top tier tax rate was at ninety percent. Because Eisenhower let these corporations and wealthy people know, look, if you're not going to invest in the country, then take your money. And he did. Seems something that today's politicians are afraid of because of the funding the, uh, campaigns and what have you. The six, the six largest publicly traded oil companies made more than $70 billion, billion in 90 days. It's not inflation. Stop saying inflation when you mean record-breaking corporate profits. They have no intention in investing back you know, it makes me think of the foolishness that went on during different Republican administrations. We got this uh, trickle down theory. You know, oh, you get the Republican, you get the corporations and the wealthy tax breaks. They're 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 going to reinvest in the community. They're going to create jobs. That was the big thing. They're going to create jobs. No, they're not. And if they do, they're not going to create any jobs that people are going to live on or be able to live on. You know, it's something how these um, right-wingers, currently Republicans, talk about traditions of family and, and values and family values and what have you. It's all BS. It's all BS. You know what? Look, it's something how they talk that crap. Mm. And one of the first things you look at is the way women were treated and still are because what the Republicans want is control of women's bodies. Specifically, white women. They really don't care if black women get abortions, get rid of them anyway. Because most of them come from traditions of eugenics. 
And right now they're afraid because in a lot of places the birth rate, they have a zero percentage birth rate. They have more people dying than they have being born. And that's when you get all this repra replacement crap. And I look at some women specifically white women who are really responsible for the first election of Donald Trump. Now yeah, here's some of these uh, conservatives. Now of course their main thing is they want to turn back the clock. It, it, it's something that all I'm seeing to have is leave it to beaver fantasy of what uh, uh, life should be or how our society should function. They want ownership back. I heard one uh, conservative say, yeah, we need to go back to the time before women had the right to vote. And the crazy thing is, I seen a couple of white women, white women conservatives say the same thing. Y'all don't seem to remember what it was like for women before 1970. Or in 1970. Women could not own credit cards under their own names. Now y'all run around, I'm an independent woman. Yeah, you what? You, women could not lease property in their own names. Women could be fired for becoming pregnant. Women could not be admitted to an Ivy League university. Women could not attend military academies. I heard one of these right wing women, I'm going to talk about her later. Declared that she was the first woman from her state to graduate from a military academy. And she's 40 ish, maybe 50 ish. That was, what, maybe 30 years ago. Is that the, the early 90s? The women could not be astronauts. In some states, women could not serve on juries. In some states, women could not serve as a judge. You know, they blame the um, sexual revolution for the denigration of our society as a crime. There's women struggled to be able to get a birth control pill. At the same time, they could not refuse sex from their husbands. You didn't feel like it, you couldn't say no. You were in the marriage, your husband could rape you without any punishment, with impunity. Women could not receive direct consultation from their phys about their physical and mental health. They really want to bring that back. You had to go to the doctor with your husband. And you were going to have some procedure done. He had to approve it. Women did not receive any paid maternity leave. Women could not protect themselves from sexual harassment. Women could not be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Women could not adopt a baby as a single person. Women were not acknowledged for running in the Boston Marathon. And women could not get abortions throughout the country. And I remember this. Girls could not wear pants to school. Yeah.
So, what I gather from this, from all those women who are conservatives, Republicans, and want to vote, you know, are in the Trump cult. Yeah, that you're fine with being a second or third class citizen. And because racism is much more important to you. Oh, America's a Christian nation. Many times now have I told you no? Christianity is not America's religion. White supremacy is. You know, and it's something I look back at the history and what happened. And don't get it mixed. Because the Republicans back then, you know, were just as racist as they are now. This is when they came up with the Southern strategy. You look at what happened with. Yeah, and it's something because I did praise Eisenhower for taking the money to do improvements in the country. For building the interstate highway. Which overall was a good thing for the country, but not so such a good thing for black communities because a lot of those interstate highways split or destroyed black communities. Even though, even so, even so, those Republicans in the 50s and 60s and what have you would be way too liberal for the Trump cult and the Republicans of, of now. Even the Republicans of the 80s would, would, were, uh, would look back like the Republicans of the 60s and 50s. Even Nixon. As way too, too liberal. You have to wonder what happened to the Republicans. Because, look, let me tell you their, their 56 Republican platform. One, provide federal assistance to low-income communities. Protect Social Security. Yeah, it happened in the Bronx. <laughs> Provide asylum for refugees. This is what this was their platform. This is what the Republicans plan to do in '56. They wanted to extend the minimum wage. Republicans, conservatives, improve unemployment benefit system so it covers more people. Strengthen labor laws so workers can easily join a union. And assure equal pay for equal work regardless of sex. That was the Republican platform in 1956. The nuts running around on themselves, Republicans and conservatives today, will consider that socialism, communism. And one of the things they really want to do is they want to destroy Social Security. Now, a big part of the um, Republican goals, conservative goals, and it dates back even today, was to undo a lot of the advances, a lot of the advances in society that were implemented by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is what they want to do. Now, like I said, the Republicans and the Trumpsters and what have you now would consider those Republicans back then as way too liberal, even socialists and communists. Damn, wake up y'all. WHGE 95.3 FM, open eye.
WHDE 95.3 FM. The Advocacy Education Station. How many of you heard of, I'm sure, you know, some of you that know history, have heard of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. And he was a famous general. It's a Nazi. As a famous general. Don't you know? And this is so in Germany. There are no statues of him. There are no monuments to him. Because what he fought for was evil. Though the Germans teach. The truth about Nazi Germany. And that's why you can go to Germany and you won't see statues of uh, Hitler and Goebbels and this, that, and the other. And I'll tell you something, slavery was also evil. The men who fought for it were traitors. Now imagine if you were Jewish, would you want to see statues of Nazis? But that's how black Americans feel about Confederate statues. We don't want to see that crap. Belongs in a museum and the truth needs to be told about it. Mm. And when this comes up in the media, you know, well, you know, we, we, we have to understand that some people look at this as their heritage. So you have a heritage of racism and hatred. And the media are so desperately afraid of being accused of bias. <coughs> and that's partly because there's a whole machine out there, an organized attempt to accuse them of bias whenever they say anything that the right wingers don't like. So rather than try to report things objectively, they settle for, for, for being even-handed, which is not the same thing. It's not the same. I think that the, um, the media for the most part has become a bunch of stenographers not reporters. They allow themselves to be goaded and pushed into repeating the, 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 the crap that spews out of right-wing conservatives and not challenge the validity of it. Yeah, I saw Lawrence O'Donnell uh, MSNBC host and he slammed the press corps when they had uh, a press conference the Orange is actually held a press conference in Mar-a-Lago where he just stood up there and rambled and lied and this that and the other and they didn't even challenge him And then one of the things Lawrence O'Donnell said was they accepted the answers because they don't know what a real answer is. Because he wasn't answering any questions. He just stood up there and rambled and they would ask questions and he would ramble off some crap that had no, no, nothing to do with the answer. No basis in reality. And yet they wouldn't stand up to him. And at the same time, he showed a clip of a press conference by uh, President Joe Biden where they were shouting over each other. And, you know, and the reality is what it is. 
Joe Biden looked like a flustered old man. All these people hollering from me from all across the room, from different places in the room. Who caught hell getting his stuff together? We need to treat Trump the same way and cut this fair and balanced crap because there is no balance with y'all. It's just nuts. And I bring that up. One of the reasons I bring that up is because of something I saw uh, what was it, on CNN. Mm -hmm. Where uh, Karen Mace, she upset the whole little panel up there. You know, and it's something how the headlines read that Nancy Mace catches hell for intentionally butchering Kamala Harris's name on CNN. Now, the crazy thing is, when she first mentioned Kamala, she pronounced her name right and went back and corrected herself, if you could call it that, and mispronounced her name. And then when she was called out on it, she declared, I, I call her whatever I want. It reminds me of something that happened to me uh, when I was in, in, in the uh, printing industry. We had these older white ladies came in to the counter. And uh, I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Patrice. Can I help you? And one lady said, oh yeah, Patrick. Hey, excuse me, ma'am. My name is not Patrick. My name is Patrice. She said, oh, well, why would you want to call yourself that? I don't really like that. So I'm going to call you Patrick. The hell you are. We are not on the plantation and I am not uh, uh, I am not Toby. You ain't got me tied up to some tree and gonna whip my name out of me. Then you will either call me by my name correctly or you can go the hell out of here and get your printing somewhere else. And she came back and asked my employer, why was I so upset? And he told her, how dare you? What gives you the right to change his name? Yeah, and like Sister uh, Sherry said, oh, donkey face, uh, Karen Mace, or Nancy Mace, Maki Mace, whatever her name is. How you like that? Like I said, you know, the headline, especially from some some of these publications, I kind of tripped out on. You know, because the panel featuring her, as it says, where I get this from, I think I got this from The Root. Okay, that she caught hell after mispronouncing Kamala Harris's name. She want to call it Kamala or some crap. Democratic uh, strategist Keith Boykin. And Vanderbilt University professor Michael Eric Dyson checked Mace on her alarming disrespect several times to which the congresswoman, like I said, replied, I just did and I'll do it again. I will say Kamala's name any way I want to. Clearly taking a page out of Trump's playbook by mocking Harris's name. And it goes on to say how Red Dyson was swift and thorough without he read Mace for complete filth. This congresswoman is a wonderful human being, Tyson began. But when you disrespect Kamala Harris by saying you will call her whatever you want, I know you don't intend it to be that way. That's the history and legacy of white disregard for the humanity of black people. In typical Karen fashion, and uh, Mace immediately played the victim. Oh, so now you call me a racist. That is BS. That's complete BS, Mace claimed. 
<laughs> However, Dyson cleared the air as politely as possible. I just said, you weren't a racist. No, he retorted. You don't have to intend the, the, uh, racism to accomplish it. Your disrespect to Kamala Harris is part and partial of a tradition. Okay, you know what? Mr. Dyson, I'm at to call BS on you. Because when she came out and said, oh, so now you're calling me a racist. After she just sat up there and did some racist crap. You, your response should have been goddamn right. Yes, you are. You're a racist ass. You know, things continued to go off the rails when Boykin told Mace to admit that she was in the call. See, what it was, it was, um, they asked her about Trump saying that Kamala Harris, you know, she, she identified as Indian all along and she stretched over the black. And the crazy thing about that is I've heard some black people say, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's what she did. She switched over from being an Indian. And then when it's come time to deal with black people, she became black. Shut up. Shut up. Shut the hell up. I don't know how many black people. I, I got some Indian in my family. Jeez Louise. Boykin tweeted about the interview. This is what the Republican Party has become. No, no, Mr. Boykin, that's not what the Republican Party has become. That's what it's been all along. WHGE 95.3 FM, the open eye. Gibbs, this is the open eye. Hope you're enjoying it. Okay, um, I followed the Olympics a little bit. And what have you? Um, primarily, I was. Uh, I'm a fan of Shakari Richardson. Yeah, I think she's a beast. She's a hell of an athlete. Simone Biles, unbelievable athlete. Greatest gymnast of all time, hands down. Not, not, hands down. Yeah, that's where greatest greatest gymnast of all time. And one of the things that was crazy was that for the first time ever, they included break dancing in the Olympic competition. What a joke. If anyone saw who, uh, and I, I, I might have mentioned it last week, I really don't remember, saw the, uh, the woman from, from Australia. So Australia sent its best. And this was the best they had. This one was an absolute complete clam. You talk about a, a cultural appropriation. And this one was on here doing the bunny hop and everything. And the crazy thing is, she claims to have a PhD in hip hop and break dancing. I don't know if they have um, Walmart or a Dollar Tree store in Australia, but if she got her PhD, that's where the hell she got it. It was just an absolute insult. 
to the culture that break dancing came out of to even allow her to participate. Yes, she came in last place and was given a zero, but I think her whole purpose was to ridicule and denigrate hip hop culture. Oh, now she's on the internet begging people to stop uh, denigrating her and bullying her and making threats to her and insulting her. And you should have thought about that before you got up and did the crap that you did. Cultural appropriation occurs when elements of one culture are adopted or borrowed by another, often without proper understanding or respect for the original context. This phenomenon is especially prevalent in the realms of fashion, music, art, and even language. The key issue lies in the potential for the dominant culture to exploit or trivialize aspects of a marginalized culture leading to the erosion of its cultural significance. I mean, how often have we seen that? Fashion, hairstyle, I remember in, what was it, in the 70s, now it's coming up, there was this movie called Ten, with this woman in it named Bo Derrick, who had her hair braided. And then white women started braiding their hair and what happened. While black women braiding their hair would get fired from a job or, or, or not allowed employment for wearing their hair the way it naturally comes out of their head. Only people punished for wearing their hair the way it naturally grows out of their head. To the extent that many states have had to implement the Crown Act. Which states that black women cannot be discriminated against for wearing their hair the way it naturally grows out of their head. There's recently a young man, uh, who I think he was either on the wrestling team or something, where he was not allowed to participate for having dreadlocks. At the same time, white people are called daring and, 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 and fashionable for wearing their hair in styles that black people are denigrated for it. The key issue lies in the potential for the dominant culture to exploit or trivialize aspects of a marginalized culture leading to the erosion of its culture. Has anybody ever heard of Pat Boone? WHDE 95.3 FM, Dove and I. WHGE 95.3 FM mm -hmm. um, Brother uh, Latif, I want to thank you for this You know the thing about crazy people is they don't know they are crazy That's what makes them crazy It, it, it baffled, this is, I'm quoting uh, Brother Latif Right here Brother Lati said, it baffles my mind to know that half of this country listens to Donald Trump and can't realize that he's insane and all about himself only. I'm concerned that it's possible that crazy people cannot recognize other crazy people, meaning that half of this country are filled with crazy people. Obviously, people who exhibit a personality disorder 
are very undiscerning, making these times very dangerous for the least powerful because the crazies may not be aware of the difference between reality and their feelings. In the medical field, that's called psychosis. Schizophrenia, and, and, and what's that? Schizophrenia or anesthesia. I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, but you get what I mean. It makes me think of when George W. was reelected. And it was, I think it was the, the London Daily Mirror. Headline said, 59 million stupid ass Americans. Now, the representative Eric Swalwell, because remember, the orange disaster you, it, it's something, the, the presidential contest, even when Biden was still running, was still the Democratic nominee. Now it's between Vice President Harris and Trump. It should really be no contest. Of course, a big part of that problem is that the, the the press, the media, gives him any validity at all. They should be dogging him, dogging him out. Representative Eric Swalwell said, and said, I don't say this lightly. When we escape this Trump hell, America needs a presidential crimes commission. It should make, be made up of independent prosecutors who look at those who enabled a corrupt president. Example one, sabotaging the mail to win an election. You got a, a prosecutor running against a current felon, not an ex-felon, someone who is currently facing jail and has 34 felony convictions. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, part of our, our, our problem and the reason that we're, we're not advancing is because we have got our priorities all screwed up. Yeah, I saw a young lady who had visited China. And she said she realized something. Because when she was there, she saw all the technological advancements and what have you. And how Chinese society was taking care of its people. Was it? In the last 10 years, China has raised 800,000 of their citizens out of poverty. Okay, I got a quote here. Since 1979, do you know how many times China has been at war with anybody? None. Yet America has stayed at war. Over its almost 250 year history, the United States has only enjoyed something like 16 years of peace. Out of damn near 250 years. This is according to former President Jimmy Carter. He said the U.S. is the most warlike nation in the history of the world. He said America has wasted close to $3 trillion on military spending. Meanwhile, China has not wasted a single penny on war, and that's why they're ahead of America in almost every way. This is what Jimmy Carter was saying to Trump back in 2019. I remember when Jimmy Carter pointed out that the Tea Party was racist, the conservatives and the sorry ass media, including CNN, MSNBC, and of course Fox News, had a hissy fit. Jimmy Carter was labeled a doddering old man speaking out of turn and was uh, uh, accused of finding racism where 
there was none. As if it's hard to find racism in America. Let me tell you something. When former President Jimmy Carter from rural Georgia in the damn 1920s says something is racist, he knows what the hell he's talking about. Can you imagine the number of toothless crackers he grew up around? No, you can't. Don't even try. Because if you didn't grow up during a time when racism was seen as the way things were, where a white person who was polite to a black person was seen as a traitor to their race, where being a dirt poor white man meant that you had to find someone to beat up on, and you sure as hell were going to go after the rich white people actually keeping you down, where there were more lynchings of blacks than in any other state but Mississippi. Rural Georgia. Shut the hell up and listen to the man. Because he knows from racists. Believe that. Let me tell you something. Black people lived in terror for a hundred years after slavery. A slight violation of the racial code. A white man's sour mood or the whim of a dishonest white woman, white woman could send a black man to a horror of degradation and death. WHGE 95.3 FM, The Open Eye. Close them out here. All right. Okay. Here we're talking about systemic racism. What works in the exact same way as functionalism, but in particular with these five elements religion, education, economy, media, and culture. Okay, let's start with religion. So they gave us a false image of a blonde hair, blue eyed, white skinned Jesus. When Jesus, if he existed, was a black man from Northeast Africa. And we can end that argument real quick. Was Jesus a Greek? No. Was Jesus a Roman? No. Because these were the only white people in that area at the time. And then they say he was the son of God in that image. So if the son of God is white, then the father must also be white. And in the same time, black is depicted as negative and evil and bad and unworthy. So the religion planted the seed, but it didn't stop there. Because after religion planted the seed, we went to education, to the educational system, into the schools. And in the schools, through that toxic post-colonial white supremacist content in the books, it reinforced the negativity that already got from the religion. And then we read comprehension passages and exercises and books like First Seed in English and Students Companion and comprehensive books about black people depicted as poor and suffering and starving and hungry and images of Africans bare-breasted, breasting, bare back covered with flies and the United Nations helicopter coming in with so-called aid. So it started with the religion saying God is white, well, the devil is black. Then you go to school in the educational system, and then you learn reinforcement of these principles and ideals of black inferiority and white supremacy. And then you go across to the economy, which as a result of the racist thinking, 
that was behind the idea of enslavement in the first place, you have social class, segregation, and stratification, and the rich ruling over the poor, and the borrower being a slave to the lender, and the masses of black people living in ghettos, not being able to get loans from banks, not being given e equality of opportunity when it comes to any kind of financial matters. To start with the religion goes across the educational system is reinforced within the economy and then the media highlights now the negative images profiling and stereotyping of young black men as gangsters, criminals, thugs, violent alcoholics and drug dealers, killers in jail, filling the jails. This is institutionalized racism I'm talking about and how it works. And then from the media then goes to the culture. So now, the talented young brother in the culture is going to put out an album, perform a song, create some kind of cultural entertainment product, but the culture that is going to be produced from his consciousness goes right back to the very beginning of the cycle of institutionalized racism from the religion he learned, that God was white and the devil was black. Then in education, he learned of uh, the inferiority of Africa and African people. That all we ever were, were savages, slaves, and living in jungles. Then over into the economy, he observes the segregation of the, and, and, uh, and the stratification, the ghettoization, and the poverty of black people. Then he goes over to the media, which reinforces all that in the religion, education, the economy. And now it's time for him to send out a message to his own people through entertainment and culture. And what he reflects now is all of the self-hatred and negativity and toxic poisoning thinking about black people. And so when he sings his song, what do you expect to come out of this song? When he speaks about the black women who is the queen of the planet Earth, Mother civilization, goddess of the universe. How do you think he's going to sing about her? Disrespect, promiscuity, almost justifying, degrading her, even raping her. Put it up on stage, perform like an animal. And now he's singing about smoking weed, taking drugs, shooting and killing, lighting up the block and spraying those with a machine gun. But you see, the racism was not individual isolating. It was institutionalized and systemic. So from one dimension of society, it filters over into the other until it produces a cycle. And now, after going through that grinding mill of systemic racism, now we're ready to become a father. But we end up as an absentee father, making children not taking care of them because we ourselves were poisoned in such a way that we're simply fulfilling the same old narrative of self-hatred and self-destruct. Systemic racism. I'm Patrice Gibbs, WHGE 95.3 FM, The Open Eye. Come in. All right, all right. Thank you for joining us on Open Eye. Hope you learned something. I know I did before I got here and hope I was able to impart it to you in such a way that it sinks in. And as we always tell you, destiny determines who enters your life, but you decide who stays. Therefore, value those who value you and don't treat those as a priority who treat you as an option. This has been Open Eye. I'm Patrice Gibbs. All right, all right. Thanks for joining us on the Open Eye. And as we always tell you, Global Africa Supremacy. 
because the world was a much better place when the African ruled. Thanks for joining us.